Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the international man of all combat sports, fresh off a flight from Saudi Arabia, and one of the few people on the entire planet giving Francis Ngannou a chance against Tyson Fury, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Uh, I wasn't feeling too great before I took a shower and a shave. Now I, I, it's amazing what a difference a shower and a shave can make after you just traveled 24 hours, uh, left the hotel in, in uh, Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, a little more than 24 hours ago, and then got into JFK a couple hours ago. So feeling good. You know, that old saying, even if you go to a place that the streets are paved with gold, it couldn't be nicer, the hose couldn't be nicer, everyone couldn't be better to you. Um, just extraordinary opulence but also enthusiasm for the sport of boxing uh just you know and respect for the fighters and the participants in the sport i like to see that uh every everything was just top shelf and beyond but that old saying is true ken there's no place like home and and you know when the bird finally landed you know after 13 and a half hour flight from from Saudi, from Riyadh, and then, uh, well, actually, uh, two-hour flight to Jeddah, then 13 and a half hours from uh, Jeddah to, to JFK, uh, three-hour layover in Jeddah. Uh, and then and then a four hours to get from JFK to Staten Island. Yeah, that's when it gets a little bogged up when when, <laughs> it, when you get when you get over here. But just just extraordinary stuff, extravaganza, Super Bowl type event and week. Uh, again, the I want to get his name right, but the host over there, uh, the His Excellency uh, Turkey Al um he's the he's the. His Excellency of, I guess, the Saudi Royal Court um, and the advisor, I, I guess, uh, under the rank of, uh, of, of minister, but basically the chairman of the General Entertainment Authority Sports, I guess, and entertainment would probably cover it. But he, he's the one that put it all together. Again, it doesn't impress me to just see opulence, to be honest. You know, what impresses me, because you know it's out there. They have oil money. Uh, they have the ability to do things other countries can't do, other people can't do. But the enthusiasm, the, the honest enthusiasm, pure passion and respect for the sport and for the participants of the sport that I saw on display, that impressed me. Uh, and And his... All of their ability to be such a host, but but gracious host, you know, not snobby host. Gracious, everyone just couldn't be nicer to you, couldn't do more for you. And I know there's always a couple sides to an equation. I get it uh, to look at it. I'm just right now. I'm I don't know. I'm being honest, but I'm being blatantly honest and selfish. That it was a great trip. Uh, I saw a country that is trying to change their reputation, trying to, in, in many areas, in many dimensions, um, many dimensions, and, and good dimensions. But, and they're using sport in general, boxing, but sports, whether it's tennis, whether it's golf, you know, soccer, Formula One, race car driving, whatever it is, they're trying to basically make Riyadh uh, over there in Saudi, a sports mecca and and a and a tourist attraction, a place where people will want to come, and will want to come because of sports, of but also because of the way they're be treated. They want to come because uh, obviously <laughs> the opulence I just touched on, but that they will feel that they're in a place that they'll feel good about being in. And and look, it was one week they were at their best. I get it. But I'm looking around, too, and seeing, you know, seeing the work they put into the country where for the last five years, some of my guys over there would tell me, we stayed at the Four Seasons, beautiful place, and they would tell me that everything is brand new in that city, and you can see it, the last five years, 
they they did a renaissance. They they wanted to make a change in that part of the country, and they are they are doing it. And this was the kickoff of Riyadh season, their sports season. So they wanted to do a big bang, and they did a big bang. It was the equivalent of Super Bowl week. I mean, all of the stuff going on, the fighters that they brought in, past and present, mostly past, just extraordinary. Um, and the events, you know, one after another, just, again, and the extravaganza, similar to Super Bowl week, you saw the entertainment value before they got in the ring. They brought everyone. We, we were at a dinner the night before the fight where, where uh, it was hosted by His Excellency. And we're, we're all there. And my son, and that was the best part. That really was the best part. You know that old commercial, Ken, you know, with uh, two tickets to the game, three hot dogs, two sodas, uh, you know, uh, uh, popcorn, you know, $100. Nowadays, it's probably 500 whatever. Uh, but being with your son, the experience, priceless. That That's the commercial. That I could do that commercial, and I would do it from my heart. That That's what really was special for me that I was able to be with my son Teddy the third and to see a you know a lifetime trip uh and to share it with him I wish my whole family could be there but you never know you never know what the future brings but again uh I'm looking at you know the bright side of the road but there was no other side of the road to look at it for or from I I know what they're doing uh, they, there's no pretense about it. They're they're looking to revigorate uh, an image. They're looking to change an image. They're looking to uh, open the doors to the world, uh, you know, j- tourism, but the world. And they and and their sport sport is a big part of it. And again, the host, he is a boxing fanatic. See, that's the thing. He's a boxing crazy i mean you could see how much he really appreciated all of these great fighters being there and and what he thought of them how he would come up to every one of us and shake our hands you know and um and then his favorites like when he saw duran give him a hug <laughs> you could just you could see that was pure he's a real boxing uh you know a, a passionate boxing fan and the fight, it wasn't secondary, but it almost it's almost like one of those things where you got to remind yourself, yeah, I'm here for the fight. You know, I mean, you're, you're walking into the arena. There's three arenas. They built three arenas, and they built them in like two months. Brand, plush, I mean, something like out of the Roman Empire. And now look, people are going to say, yeah, Teddy, how do they build things that fast? You know, how do a lot of, you know what I mean? No, I don't think anybody can say that they know all the answers or that anything is exactly the way we wish and perfectly wish in a perfect vacuum of a world that we could have it. But what I'm saying is it's progress. Uh, it's, it's progress. Yeah, they have the ability to do things other countries can't do. But it, it's progress in in the attitude, in the, just the direction. And I haven't been put up to this. I, I hope my reputation precedes me enough over the last 50 years where people know I wouldn't say it if I didn't feel it, if I didn't feel it. I'll tell you another thing. His, uh, his Excellency, I'm, I'm saying it that way because I can't pronounce his darn name, but His Excellency, he, he couldn't have teamed up with a better guy than Spencer Brown, the manager, uh, for Fury, because Spencer has the kind of person. First of all, he's smart, but he's got the kind of personality that everyone feels good about being around him and doing something with him. Um, he he just represents himself for this kind of setting, perfect, just perfect. And I have to say, watching. Look, it's not like I spent a year with them. It's not like I had you know time to really know. Uh, the true sense of everybody. I, I understand that. 
But from what I did get, the first sense I got, the Fury people, the brothers, the crew, yeah, they're a little rough around the collar in, in some ways, but they're all genuine people. That's what came across to me. They're regular, genuine people that, that you know, they could be a crazy bunch. Um, whose family, who says they don't have a crazy bunch in certain areas in their family? But they, they're together. They're united. <laughs> they're having a grand old time. And again, they're just sincere people from, from everything I saw. Uh, and, and passionate about obviously what's going on in their world right now that's attached to Tyson and Tommy for that matter too, you know, but at a much different level. Again, just, just spectacular event. Um, I, I felt that I had a responsibility to, to really state that and give that backdrop before we went into the fight. Yeah, well, I, that's the, the pictures that you sent were great, and that pretty much sums up what I saw in the pictures. But um, before we get into the fight, I just want to give a quick shout out. If anyone likes listening to Teddy and loves the stories and wants to hear more about his background, you can check out his book, Atlas from the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Journey to Become a Man. It's available on Amazon, also available on audible.com. You can check out Teddy's fighting tutorial videos on dynamicstriking.com. Go to the Teddy Atlas section. I think, how many you got now? 15? 18. 18 tutorials there. You can learn all the basics, all the basic jab, uppercut, hook, et cetera, et cetera. Um, also, if anyone's going to be in the New York area, November 16th, two weeks from Thursday, Rob, myself, obviously Teddy, We'll all be at the uh, Dr. Atlas Foundation annual dinner on Staten Island. It brings out all the, all the boxing superstars from New York City. Everyone's been there. Sugar Ray Leonard, Evander Holyfield, Mickey Ward. Uh, it's a who's who in the boxing community. Please come if you're available. We'd love to meet everyone. Uh, with that, Teddy, let's talk about the fight. You called it. You said Francis has a chance, uh, has a legitimate chance in this fight, and my God, he did. I thought it that he got completely robbed. I know when I just look at the fight without scoring it officially, if I had to pick who I wanted to be at the end of that fight, I want to be Francis. Tyson was on the canvas. Tyson's eye was punched in like he went and got in a car accident, and Francis looked unscathed. Look, I don't think it was a flawless performance. And one of the things I'm dying to hear from you is, did Francis look better than we expected and or was Tyson completely unprepared? I, from my untrained eye, it looked to me like Tyson was completely unprepared, didn't look like he took it seriously. And that's to take nothing away from Francis. He did everything. I mean, I thought he won the fight, but I'd, I've seen Tyson Fury look much better in the past. But what'd you think? How'd you like it? Well, not unprepared physically, but perhaps mentally. And yeah, I picked, I said that, and probably 99% of people went the other way, not probably, but I said that Nganyu could surprise you, that he's got a chance. And let's get right to it. Why I said he had a chance. I said he had a chance because he's athletic, he's a great athlete, Anyone who could be 6'5", 270 pounds and throw kicks to someone's head and then grapple on the floor and do jujitsu and everything else that he's done through his UFC, you know what? They're athletic. And he has that great eraser. I say, punches are born, they're not made. He had that great eraser that can make up for a lot of shortcomings real fast. And he was the puncher in this fight, no doubt about it. I uh, feel he's a terrific fighter, terrific boxer, everything else. But he's not the pure player. He's a big guy. He hits you. He knocks out certain guys. You know, he knocked out Wilder twice. I mean, he hits you with all that size. He hits you right. Of course he's a puncher. But pure TNT, only certain guys have it. And I think the, the guy who really had it that night in a pure way is probably in Ganyu. But he had so many things going against him. Again, the reason I... I said he had a good shot. He had his shot. And I also said, I'm not going to add to it. I'm going to say exactly what I said. Like Warner Wolf, the great sportscaster, go to the videotape, see it. I had said that it's going to be interesting. It's going to be, I thought Fury would win, but it's going to be interesting. And it was 
interesting. Some people say it was boring. It was this one. It was interesting. It was, I didn't think I didn't think it was boring at all. And I'm well, dying it can't here be because if, there, if there was, was apprehension because you didn't know, especially after he dropped them, you didn't know what shoe was going to fall next. But we've seen some boring heavyweight fights. This, I mean, he, Francis unfortunately was involved in one of them <laughs> with Derek Lewis. Yeah, but there was apprehension here. There was tension. There was anxiety. You weren't sure what you were watching. That am I really watching what I'm watching? That this guy in his first pro fight could win the heavyweight title or could upset the heavyweight? Like that's what kept you. That's what kept you on the edge of your seats. That kind of like a good driller. I'm dying to know. It, did you th right when the fight started, like first round? I was like, "Wow, I'm really surprised at how calm well, well, that's Francis the thing is I'm in the get pocket." To. Yeah, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Listen, there's a combination of reason why I said he had a good shot. One, a athletic. Two, that he had the power to to just clean up things. And three, and here's the key. This is the most important one. And nobody really paid attention to this one. All they paid attention to was the shortcomings, the negative, or the, what he didn't have. They didn't think of what he had. He didn't have the experience. He hadn't been a boxer. He didn't make his living in a ring, in a squared circle. 100%. No, no kidding. So he's got no shot. The reason I said he had a shot, and I always say to, to, to the cows go home, that 75% of my business and in the MAA, any combat business, but in my business, in boxing, 75% is mental. And because of that, he had a shot. The reason he had a shot was, yeah, even though he hadn't been a pro boxer, he'd been a professional fighter. And he had been in that cauldron. I call it a cauldron. That furnace. That furnace where... Ordinary people haven't been in it. If they do, they get burnt up. Their, their will to win, their, whatever they had going in, their belief systems, they get evaporated. They, they, they get vaporized in that cauldron. But when you've been a fighter and you've been in that cauldron, then you're used to that atmosphere. You've breathed that air before. You've been, you know what to expect that you're not going to be overwhelmed by that pressure chamber. The pressure is not going to eat you alive. It's not going to shrink you from 6'5", 270 to 5'4", 120. It's not going to do that to you. It's not going to take away your, your belief that you're going to win. The, when, the, when the devil knocks at the door and he knocks, he knocks, he knocks when, when you're in something dangerous, when you're in something confrontational, when you're something threatening, when you're in something that is that competitive, something that demands a will, demands a discipline, something that you'd rather be somewhere else in certain moments, something that is, is, is that can be, feel that dire, where you're in that kind of atmosphere the devil does knock he knocks at the door and only the people that have been there that have been through this that have as i said before they've been they've breathed the air before only them can lock the door and say you're not coming in only they can do it the others allow the door to open and the devil come in and take away everything that they thought they believed in going in where they where they start to submit and compromise, compromise all of the things that one must never compromise in life. One was never compromise. The, the, the understanding that it's still your choice. It's, it's up to you what you're going to do. It's not up to the moment. It's not up to the guy that, that's in front of you. It's up to you. How are you going to behave? How are you going to act when that, knock comes when that moment comes and that's the only reason i gave in ganyu a real chance because with all the physical talent in the world if he didn't have that if he hadn't been in that atmosphere before where i knew that not only i could count on him that he could count on himself that's what this is about that he knew 
that he could count on himself. He knew what would happen when the, when the knock came at the door and how he would behave. He knew how the air would change. He knew the temptations that were going to come into his head to say, you, could, you did enough. You could bow out now. Yeah, you could find a way in, to the exit now. He understood the terrain that only a fighter could understand that terrain. And that's why I knew that with the talent that he had physically, he would have a chance to take that talent, to execute that talent. Otherwise, he couldn't execute that talent. Otherwise, that talent would have been worthless, meaningless. It would just make good photo ops. And up to that point, all it was was good photo ops. But that's why, that is why I gave him a chance. And then here's what transpired. His trainer, his real trainer, Mike Tyson's not his trainer. I think everyone knows that. He was there for photo ops. He was there, you know, for, not in a bad way. I mean, it was smart to have him there. Plus, Francis really likes him and, and, and was... In, in some ways enamored with him and so um, he showed him a few uh, all of that's positive he gave him a positive feeling and that's good he did his job Tyson that is but the real job was by his trainer Dewey I don't know the whole name I think his name's Dewey if you can look it up I want to give him his proper props or his full props but he did a hell of a job in technically taking what he had physically and technically giving him... His name is du du Dewey Cooper, by the way. Dewey Sorry, Cooper did Dewey a good Cooper. job. Yeah. To, he did a good job, and he deserves my recognition here from everybody. Where it's one thing you have the ability, but then, as I've been saying, you have to have a delivery system to get the power to the target. Otherwise, it don't have any value that way from a physical standpoint. And he had to learn certain techniques. And I put it out there. It started with the jab. It started with the jab. And he gave him a jab. He, he had him looking like a guy that you would never believe it was his first pro fight, especially in, on this kind of stage with the heavyweight champ of the world. He, what he basically did was he took the talent. He took the talent of Nganyu and he gave him wheels. He gave him wheels to drive to the finish line. He, like a car. You know, he, he, he put wheels on it. Yeah, the engine was there, but it had no wheels to get anywhere. He gave that engine wheels. He really did. And he helped Nganyu navigate and know the roadmap to where the hell he was going to drive his car. He did a hell of a job, and and Ganyu did a hell of a job as a student. I, that's another thing. It's one thing to be physically gifted. It's another thing to be smart enough and coachable enough to be able to make changes and adaptations and absorb knowledge. I knew he could. Why? Because three, what was it, three, four years ago, I, I was in the gym. He had asked me to come to the gym when I was in Vegas to train him for one day. And it's out there. The video's out there. And I trained him for one day, as he asked me to. And I saw how coachable. I saw how smart he was. And, and I kept saying this months ago that don't sleep on. And listen, I was very straight, as I always try to be, where it was a money grab. They were both grabbing money. No doubt. That's still the same, but it was a dangerous money grab. And you know what? That's exactly the right way to put it. It was because he had all the things I just laid out there to give himself a chance. To give him and a better chance than that line from the movie Dumb and Dumber. You know, where uh, the guy says, what's the chance of you going out with me to some pretty girl? She said, one in 400 million zillion to one. And he goes, so you're saying I have a chance. You're saying I have a chance. Well, he had a real chance. Hey, guys, I want to take a quick break to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Premier Fight Picks. Bardia over at Premier Fight Picks is a top combat sports better and analyst with a 70% winning record publicly tracked for over five years. He's been on fire as of late, profiting on the last 9 out of 10 events. If you like to bet on fights and you're looking for help picking winners, visit PremierFightPicks.com to subscribe. With lots of great fights coming up, now's the perfect time to sign up. 
Bardia is offering weekly, monthly, and yearly subscriptions to get you in on the best MMA bets, quick picks, and analysis. For a limited time only, use the promo code ATLAS, that's A-T-L-A-S, at checkout for a recurring 30% off your subscription of choice. Again, that's promo code ATLAS for a recurring 30% off your subscription of choice. Lastly, make sure to follow Bardia on Instagram at Premier Fight Picks and on Twitter at PFP Handicapping to get the free bets and fight breakdowns and analysis every week. Check them out. Speaking of movies, I I want to I want to just say, and I I've forgotten to say it when I was announcing all of those greats that were there. I got to tell you. Sitting there, even a guy that's 50 years in a business, I'm sitting there with my son, and they're walking into the room. We're having lunch uh, with our host. And one after another, we were one of the first there. And one after another, they're walking in, walking in, walking in, walking in. My son is like tapping me, Dad. I said, yeah, well, who else is coming? I don't know. Boom, another one, another one, another one. All the names I just put out there. It really did feel like a real life, real life version of that movie, Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner, where all the great ball players from yesterday came walking out of the cornfields onto the baseball diamond. And you're like, oh my God, that's Shoeless Joe Jackson. That's so and so. That's so. That's what this was. It was, and and I don't think anyone was, I, I don't think anyone was disappointed. Uh, at the end of the day that that came out there. And uh, again, I gave him a chance because of all of that. And what played out? What played out was Dewey Cooper, his trainer, gave him a chance by giving him enough basics. And that was one of the keys. I said, look, his power's not enough. He's got to have a way to get it to the target, a jab. That has to be part of it. And another part, footwork. It's not just what he did, Ken. It's what he didn't do. He didn't lunge. He didn't do what you would expect from a novice in his first pro boxing match, even though he's been a striker for a long time, where he would throw wide punches and and take big steps trying to get in all at once because he was excited. And he was unknowledgeable in those areas or unpolished or not polished in those areas where the biggest threat or danger to him was, and a lot of people thought it would happen, and I was concerned, where he would try to get in all at once too far away, leave himself open to counterpunches, which, which Fury controls the outside, he counterpunches really well, where that didn't happen. Why? Because he was taught to take short steps, small steps, not trying to take over large steps where you get there all at once and you leave yourself wide open. Little short steps, beautiful, good technique, good boxing form. Uh, The jab, coming in behind the jab, putting bugs on the windshield to keep Fury, his vision blurred, to keep him busy, to keep him from dominating you with his own jab. On the outside, all of those things were present in part. And if I went to one physical characteristic, you're not going to guess what it is, Ken. I want you to guess because there's so many of them. Power, this, that, his improvement. in One physical characteristic that saved the day for him, that really did. It saved the day. Well, patience was part of it. But it's a physical characteristic, not a mental, not an emotional one. Now, the patience was part of what allowed him to be in the fight, that he didn't overexert himself. He didn't uh, get carried away with the moment. He didn't try to get it all at once. He didn't try to hit a home run the first time he got up to bat. You know, he just tried to put wood on the ball. And that's the right way to say it and get on base. So, yeah, patience, control, um, discipline. But there's one physical characteristic, his chin. His chin. Yeah. His chin. His granite chin. He's got that 
that stocky neck like Mike Tyson had. He's got that stocky neck that's a shock absorber to taking punches. And this is a guy who takes punches with four ounce gloves. Now he was in there with ten ounce. They 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 were you know what the effect those punches had? They had the effect of raindrops on a windshield. They just splashed off. The, his chin, he got hit some right hands. His chin kept him, his chin, without his chin, who knows what happens, but not what did happen. And he also took an elbow because in the MMA, you take elbows. And if that was a regular fighter and he took that elbow from Tyson Fury, I don't know how he would have acted. The champs, the top guys would have handled it, but it, w- it wouldn't have been handled quite as seamlessly, as easily as it was handled by a guy who was an MMA fighter, was a UFC champion, has been hit with them before. So all of that. And again, to Dewey Cooper, the game plan. Here's the game plan. And I'm going to get to the, I'm going to analyze the whole thing and get to who I thought won. And I, and, and I, I think that I'm on a button with this. And not everyone's going to like it because it was one of those fights. Where you're not going to satisfy everyone. But you know what? The good news, I have practice in that area. I lived my whole life not trying to please everybody. So I'm, I'm kind of good at that. I, I, I'm not too worried about that part. You know what I mean? So if I was, if, if I was with my, uh, some of my Italian friends right now, I'd give you that Italian uh, salute that comes from underneath the chin. But I don't believe in doing that stuff uh, uh, here. You know, we want to be gentlemen. We don't want to uh, show any vulgarity in any way. But you know what I mean. Like uh, 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 the ones that don't agree, ah, uh, you know what? Ah, fa, uh, fa, uh, ooh, ah. You know, uh, along those lines. And, and with a little motion with the back of your hand, you know, uh, as though you're, you know, as though you're maybe you're seeing how good your shave was that morning. But everyone thought that the power would come. They they really did a end the round on Fury. Everyone thought that the power would come from the right hand of Ngannou. So what did they do? They developed a left hook, a counter left hook that dropped them in the third round. Beautiful counter. Tyson Fury throws the right hand, stays there, split second, bang. Left hook on top of the head, back of the head, bad place to get in. He goes down. But then he does what he always does. He gets up. That's why he's heavyweight champ. That's why he's here. That's why he's making hundreds of millions of dollars. Because he gets up. And he got up that first fight with Wilder. Uh, the best puncher in heavyweight boxing hit him on the chin with right hand. His Sunday punch. That left took what a... I thought it was brilliant. Because everyone's looking for the right hand. And what does he... What does he wind up showing? A left hook. And I guarantee you, Tyson Fury had no idea that this guy would be able to show a left hook. No idea. So again, the element of surprise, being smart, having a game plan, all of that, and, and working to execute it, that, all of that, it was, it was just magnificent. But here's the reality. The reality of the fight, the first two rounds, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read my scorecard, but the first two rounds go to Fury. Before I even go any further, there were a lot of non-eventful, non-action rounds where you could have had even rounds. It wasn't the easiest to score, but I scored them. But there were a lot of nothing rounds, quiet rounds, where either side, there wasn't a lot going on. Just not rounds where you could steal. And I'll tell you, yep. Tyson Fury was experienced in his height, his reach, and his control on the outside, and he, he was in the right place. Control on the outside with his reach advantage, his height advantage, his long arms, his jab. He fought it in the right geography, the right dimensions. And there were rounds he could just steal, steal. People said Sugar Ray let it, the great Sugar Ray let it. Stole rounds from Marvin Hagler in the end of rounds to win that fight or to get that. Well, Fury stole rounds. That doesn't mean he didn't earn them. I mean, he, he didn't go and, you know, uh, when the lights were off and, and go and take them. He, that's a 
that that's a term we use in box. He he stole. He out hustled him. He 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 just got the attention of the judges enough to make a non eventful round his round. He stole them. And so there was a lot of those rounds. There was a lot of rounds, quite frankly, there was a lot of posturing, a lot of fainting, a lot of half jabs, but not a lot of real punching or, or real um, concrete action or, or damage. Now, damage, I'll stay on that. The damage was done in this fight by Nganu. The more damaging punches was done by Nganu, but it was only in a couple rounds. Really the third and the eighth. But no doubt about that. But the volume was controlled by Fury. No doubt about that. And Fury landed some good right hands, decent right hands too. But he won more rounds. He won. He was He was able to, again, a lot of people, there's a phenomena going on here. And I'll tell you what the phenomena, and I, I will stand on a, and I'll put my hand on a Bible in a courthouse and swear that I'm right about this. And there's going to be people you're not going to convince because they made up their mind. They don't know what they don't know. They made up their minds. Their love is there. I get it. They, they saw what they saw. They want to believe it. You ain't going to change them. But give yourself a chance to listen to this. Here's the phenomena. When the unexpected happens at a large level, like this was, where nobody gave this guy a chance. It is human nature when a guy's more competitive than anyone thought he would be, and he was. It's human nature to think that person won. Bang! It's human nature to, 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 to kind of fill in the gaps, to fill in the gaps where what you didn't see, you think you saw. Yeah, what you didn't see, you think you saw because he, he dropped him. He was competitive. He wasn't sloppy. He had a good jab. He had good technique. He was calm. To your word, he was patient. He was in control. He was confident. So you fill in all the gaps of what wasn't happening. He won. He, he did all the things because he did the unexpected. Because just that part of it fills in the gaps that, that really weren't filled by punches. But they're filled by your imagination. They're filled by the rest of you taking it the rest of the way. Where you say, oh, he's, he went the distance. He was, he was supposed to get knocked out. He dropped him. He, he, uh, he landed. He used a beautiful jab. He wasn't sloppy. He won! And not so fast, friends. And listen, I, 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 never, have, I never have a dog in a fight. And if I did... It wouldn't matter because I'd be professional, but I don't have a dog in a fight. I'm telling you from my experience, being there, I had to, and it's always full disclosure with you, full transplant, uh, transparency. I, when that fight ended, I didn't know who won, okay? Yeah, I said it. I didn't know who won. I didn't know if it was a draw. It was really close. I didn't know. I didn't know if, if Nganyu won. I, I, I'm, again, I don't have to tell you. I hope you know I'm honest about those things. My reputation is more important to me than a moment, than, than a moment going along to get along. I mean, it's, it's made me lose jobs. It's made me lose jobs. But it's going to stay important because it's, it's all I really have and my family's love and, and respect from the fans out there that came up to me that you guys don't know how much it means to me and Ken. Ken, they came up, they listened to our show. I can't, Saudi Arabia, and they're coming up to me saying, we love your podcast. We love Ken. <laughs> we love you. We, we love the guy. And one after another, and at the dinner, fighters, trainers, coming up to me say, Teddy, we love the podcast. And it was one consistent thing that they said. One consistent thing. Because you tell the truth. Because you're not afraid to rock the boat. Because you say things that other people find more difficult to say or less convenient to say. Yeah. And, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. So that's not going to change. Hearing that from fans, knowing that my, family, that my family appreciates and respects that, and, and it's, it's something to, 
to guide them with when they were younger. And thank God they got to the right places on their own because of the great people they are, the great human beings they are. But thank God they got there. But I I'm not giving that up for one day or for you know one moment or to to be more appreciated by people because there's a and i'm not going to say i'm not tempted you know that old saying i always say what cuz said what's the difference between a hero and a coward in a war the difference is what they do not what they feel they both feel afraid they both feel like running away they both feel like getting to a safer place but one one has the discipline to stay there the other doesn't they both feel the same the difference is what they do. I feel the same. When these moments come, you think I'm, I'm not aware of those feelings, those emotions, m uh, that I don't get those electric signals in my brain to say, everyone's saying it was an upset. Everyone's saying it got, let me go along. It's safer. No. No, it's not safe. Can I just say, say one thing? I think that a lot of the perception could also be affected by the fact that Fury was on the canvas and well, I, I just said that. He got dropped. No, 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 I know. And the other thing is, I thought Francis had him on roller skates at the end of the eighth round. I thought he could finish no, him. No, the eighth it was round, like, but those were the two rounds. The third yes. and the eighth. Listen, I'm going to I'm going to write I'm going to even full what I was talking about full transparency was this. At ringside, I didn't know who won. So, I want to do it the right way. This is important to me. It's important to you people. So when I got home after 24 hours of traveling, I got home. Thank God I took a shower and a shave because I, I, I looked like Howard Hughes on a bad day, you know, uh, before that. But a, a shave and a shower can do you wonders. And I look a little better, I hope. And uh, I feel a little better. But I pushed you guys back an hour. You know that. We were supposed to come on earlier. I pushed you back. Why? Because I said, you know what? I got to watch the fight in a, in a vacuum. I got to watch it in a quiet, sterile place where I don't hear nothing. I'm not there with all these people, with everything going on, seeing the unexpected, getting caught up on that, not being sure what I didn't see, what I did see. So I watched it and I took a pen and piece of paper and I watched every round cold, quiet. And here's the guy that I, I said I didn't know who won. I thought there was a good chance it was a draw, maybe a gun you even put. I don't know. Fury could have also lost a point when he hit no, him with that but elbow. Here's that where was a brutal, I know, brutal I get elbow. it, but he didn't. But here's where you and me disagree. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you said what you said at the top, that you thought he got robbed. I am so glad you said that. You know why? Because you represent... Yeah, but I don't know if I would say it was a, a robbery. Well, whatever. I just thought you thought Francis he won. won. But, and, and like I said, Francis had the knockdown and he had him in trouble in the eighth. He he never looked like he was in trouble from Fury. So just by going to which, you know, aesthetics. The reason I'm glad you said that, you came off the top. I let you go. You came off the top set uh, and gone, you won that fight. Because I you represent what a lot of people thought. Because you saw what your heart told you. You saw what you, you what, yeah, guy got dropped. Guy's supposed to have no chance. The guy's the underdog. We all love the underdog story. We love Rocky. We love the Rocky movie because the guy that wasn't supposed to have a chance turned the world on its ear and he had a chance. And that gives us all a chance. That makes us all feel better that we have a chance. And whatever we do, if Nganyu, Nganyu was Sylvester Stallone. He was Rocky Balboa. That's who he was. He, he really was in, in real life. And he represented the hopes and dreams of, of so many people that they're not sure they could ever get there and, and beat the champ. You're never going to do it. It's just not in the cards. You're not good enough. You're not in position. You weren't born to be able to ever do. And then all of a sudden you see a guy there that never had a pro boxing match looking like he's doing it. Well, then he did it. You fill in the rest because it, it's what you never expected, but it's what a part of you hoped that you get to see in your life because... Again, it keeps that flame that we all have to have. We all have to have that flame of belief that 
something special can be done if you work hard enough. That your boat can come in. Your ship can arrive. That you can... You can turn back all the naysayers. Everyone who always told you, whatever you do out there, no, you're never going to be there. You're never going to be that. And this guy was that. But at the at the end of the fight, at the end of the day, what really, he he does win because he did the unexpected. He's in position now where he, I know, I, who would have thought that I could say something like this before a few days ago. But he could fight Wilder. He could fight Joshua. He could fight a rematch with Nganyu and, and make tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. I'm not saying he's going to win those fights. But that is where he's put himself now. That really, he should never go back to MMA. He should stay in boxing. And, and people believe that he could beat these guys. There's people out there even though Wilder's been heavyweight champ, that think that he could beat Wilder. Why? Because he can punch and Wilder's been knocked out. But also that he has better form and technique than Wilder. Whoever thought you'd be saying something like that? Whoever thought that? My God. But you know what? You could make that statement and not be arrested for, for, for being a nut and, and have a straight jacket put around you and take it off to the, to the freaking wacky farm, the funny farm. <laughs> But but before you would have been taken off, if you said it before, here's the scorecard. I'm going to read it to you. I took the time. So I came home. I said, no, before I go on with, and I, listen, I take this very serious. I appreciate all 300,000 of our subscribers and more that come on that haven't subscribed. And I wish you would subscribe. If I could take the time to do this after 24 hours of traveling, could you take the time to hit a subscribe button, please? Please? But anyway, I'm going to put my glasses on. And I I watched the fight, again, in a cold setting. And I made little comments. And here's the comments. I even let Sam see the thing so you can see it. This is the real deal. This is it. This is it. This is the document. All right. First round. Again, let me set the backdrop again. Lots of posturing, lots of fainting, a lot of half jabs, a lot of looking. Could have been more even rounds. I had one even round. I tried not to have too many. First round. You ready? Go ahead. When you give me your round, when you give me your round, I'll tell you what the judges had. Beautiful. First round, 10-9, Fury on and again I made little notes. The judges should have to do what I do. Little notes of why. Why? Jab in the right hand. 10-9. First round. Two judges had it for Fury. One had it for Ngannou. Second round. Something going on over here. Ngannou. I think it was Rocky Three. The rematch with... The rematch with Club of Lang. Where... Balboa, in their training, they decided they needed an edge. They were going to turn Southpaw to throw Clubber Lang off. And that's what they did. Well, that's, you can see, that's what Ngannou had in his mind. He's not only a guy in his first pro fight fighting for the heavyweight title, but now he's turning Southpaw. Oh, my God. He's, like, sending a message. I, you have no idea what you got into here. I not only uh, am ready, I am more ready than you ever thought. I'm going to play with you. I'm going to turn Southpaw. And then Fury played with him because Fury thought it was still a little bit of a play thing. About a round <laughs> later, he was going to find out that it really wasn't. But he, <laughs> so, he, so he turned with him. Okay, I'll play with you. I'll turn Southpaw too. We'll have fun. You know, the kids have fun. You bring kids together. Go play. Have fun. And then what happens, right? Your kids, they go, all of a sudden you hear, oh, what happened? Somebody got hurt. Somebody got <laughs> hurt. You were supposed to be playing. How did somebody get, you were playing. How did someone get hurt? That's exactly what it was. Parents sent them out there to play. All of a sudden, boom, somebody got hurt. Ah, uh, wasn't expected. So he turned southpaw. Fury turned southpaw. 
He uses the jab and a straight left hand. He lands one straight left hand in the second round. That's enough to win a round. Nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. The thing that was happening was what wasn't happening. That's what was going on. What wasn't happening. And Ganyu wasn't looking like a fool. He wasn't looking like a, a klutz. He wasn't looking like a complete novice. That's what was happening. But there wasn't much else happening. But that was enough. Because it was shocking our system. Third round, 10-8. Two to, uh, the, the judges had it uh, two to one. Two judges had it for uh, Fury. One judge had it for Ngannou in the I second did, round. I did. Two of them had it right. The other guy didn't. <laughs> I have confidence in this card. I'm telling you. And I have to, you know what, Cayums, right? Because I don't like to use foul <laughs> language to say it, even though I know who I'm saying it to. I'm saying it to a lot of people that don't want to hear it. But bear with me, yeah. guys. Bear with me. Give yourselves a chance. And then at the end of the day, if you want to say, ah, fuck, funk, uh, you, you want to say that Italian phrase, uh, whatever phrase you want to use to Teddy, go ahead. But at least, at least wait. Just wait before. You still could do it. Just wait it out. All right, third round, 10-8. No doubt. Same. They all had it right. Here's the thing I put. Not only did he win it, like you could be losing a round, bang, you land, a, you win a round, right, Ken? Yep. And Ganyu, I made a note. He was winning a round before the knockdown. He was looking good. He was getting more aggressive, starting to push himself a little more, push the envelope more, uh, coming behind the jab, do something off the jab. He was, he was winning a round before the knockdown. Beautiful counter left hook after the right hand. Fury's still there. Just a little delay. You know, you're taking a picture. Just a little delay. He throws the right hand. Boom. Still, boom. Left hook real quick. Real quick. Well done. Side of the head. Fourth round. 10-9. Fury. Champ in the right hand. The reason why. Go ahead. On the fourth round, they had it... Um uh, fourth round, two to one again in favor of Tyson Fury. All right, two had it right, one had it wrong. Uh, <laughs> fifth round, 10 9. Fury, here's the reason why. He controlled Everyone the round. Everyone had it. Everyone had that round the same. Oh, they finally got it together and freaking made sense. <laughs> Controls the outside, jab, and landed the right hand. Used the jab to control the outside, landed the right hand. Okay, sixth round, 10 9. Fury. Uh, everyone had that same. Okay, good. They're, they're, they're getting better. There's hope. Um, jab, control, distance, and a lot of, a lot of dead, a lot of dead time. He, uh, he won basically posturing. See, I didn't give him credit and say he dominated. Again, just going to get what to, what I believe to be the truth. He used a jab just enough to control the distance. A lot of, Dead space, uh, and spent both of them spent a lot of time looking at each other. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing yep. okay. What about you? I'm okay. How about you? You want to have dinner later? All right. When they were so, doing that in the sixth, it looked to me like they might. It looked at first they thought maybe Francis was questioning his gas tank. He didn't look gassed, but I felt like he was purposely conserving. And then I was like, Oh, Tyson's not doing anything. Like a silent agreement. All right, let's take a little break here. No one was doing anything. Sixth round in particular, I thought that. Seventh round, I made it even. I could have given it to Fury, but I went out of my way to make it even. Because Two judges had it for Fury, one for Ngannou. Went out of my... Perfect. I'm so glad you're doing it this way. Went out of my way to give it to uh, even. I, I couldn't give it to Ngannou. I could have gave it to Fury, but I said, you know what? Close enough. Let me give him the benefit I gave it to Fury. Uh, I could have given it to Fury. I wrote to myself on a jab, um, of, but from southpaw position, uh, and Ganyu. Oh, I could have given it to Fury from the jab, but from his southpaw position, and Ganyu started good, and then he did land a straight left hand from the southpaw position. So I made it even. Okay. Now, that makes it 68-65 going into the eighth round. Eighth round, Nganyu has not won a round since the third. Big round for Nganyu. 
big round, really good round. I, I should have done more earlier, but fine. Uh, really, really good. Big round for him, more aggressive. He moved his hands, and he drew nice short shots uh, in close. So I give that round 10-9. Like I said, the first round since the third that he won, and he won it convincingly. Did everyone give him that round? I would hope so. Yep, yep, everyone had that correct. All right, ninth round. Good, guys, you, you're learning. Um, enough- there were only a few rounds. As you're going through this, there were only a few rounds where everyone yeah. agreed. Ninth round, 10-9, Fury. Everyone got that right. Here's what I wrote. A nothing burger, a nothing round. Fury stole another round. Um, stole another round. Um, oh, on the outside with his jab. Okay, now the tenth round. Close. I gave it ten nine for Fury. Here's what I wrote. Close. Another nothing round. Um, on the outside, Fury won it by using his jab. And with one counter left hook, it wasn't a beautiful turned over perfect, but he did land one counter left hook at the end of the round, the very end of the round. And just on that, because it was a nothing round, I had to give it to Fury. So my score... The judges in the 10th, in the 10th, two of the three judges gave it to Ngannou. And while I didn't score the fight, I remember watching it thinking like, oh, he pulled out the last round. I thought he might have edged him there. So no problem. All right. Uh, so my final that score, one, that's okay. My final score, 97-93 for Mr. Fury. And like I said, my comments, lots of posturing, fainting, half jabs, a lot of looking. Could have been more even rounds possibly. But um, I think it's an honest, I know it's an honest one because I, again, I'm, I'm saying what I believe. Hey guys, quick break to give a shout out to our sponsor, Athletic Greens, the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. I love this stuff. I've been preaching about it for years. I take it with me everywhere I go. It's like an insurance, pro- an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food source ingredients. It's got vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics, and antioxidants. Like I said, consider an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash atlas for 10 free travel packs. Now let me get to what happened here and why it happened it happened because everything i said but it also there's another x factor there's always an x factor especially in an upset and it was an upset because again even though his hand wasn't raised he did the unexpected and he's got a future now that he he didn't have going in here he he's gonna make tens more of millions of dollars and i'll tell you there is a part that I was questionable about, and I'll tell you what the part was. They've put hundreds of millions of dollars to people over there into this, this fight and into this event. And His Excellency said to us when we were at a lunch with him, I spent four times more for the, Trisor- for the Usyk Fury fight which was already set for December 23rd. It's not going to happen now that it was already set and scheduled for December 23rd. He told us all this that was spent on this unbelievable event, Ken, we spent four times more, four to five times more for Usyk and Fury to unify one heavyweight champ, which which is going to make this event look look small if that's possible well candidly to 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 put on the, the unify a uh, uh, heavyweight unification fight which is is so hard to even get together where two guys have all the belts like it would make sense that that would be the most expensive prize purse in boxing history but here's the thing nobody has had a prelim like this nobody has had a prelim to that of this magnitude with the money spent nobody that that was spent 
to put this together. But they're going to spend four times more. All you need to know, if you're a real person that doesn't live with your head somewhere that it shouldn't be, that you're not living in La La Land, that you're living in Realville. I try to live in Realville. I learned that through 50 years in boxing, to, to live in Realville. It's not what you wanted. It's what is mandated by the money, the powers that be. I hate to say it, but it's true. Now, I think the right guy got the decision. But where it does get a little where it adds to the perception, the, the whole atmosphere that it was a robbery, that Nganyu should have had his hand raised. What adds to that, Ken, is the fact that the Hollywood scripted setting that was there with the decision. First, they start with Nganyu. You don't think that was all felt? Didn't that feel a little Hollywood, a little scripted? Okay, nobody knows who won. I didn't know. I just said it. I'm at ringside. I don't know who won. Okay, now to the scores. 94, 94, whatever it was. 95, 94. You could correct me. For Nganyu. Whoa. Oh, whoa. 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 Let me get a paper bag and, and stop hyperventilating. Whoa! And, and, and 96, 93, Fury! Now, like, oh, mm-hmm. my God. And the final card. And I, I don't know the exact point. 95, 94. Little delay, little pause. Like the best Hollywood moment. And still, heavyweight champ... That actually, he said, and still undefeated. And I was like, "Well, they're both undefeated." What yeah, the no, hell was, are you talking about? He didn't about? choose the right. He messed up. He messed the right up. Terminology right there. You're right. Yep. But look, it was a long trip. He's getting older. It was a long <laughs> trip. But you know, he's still he's still the man. He's still the man. His reputation keeps him there. But and and he invented that catchphrase, and everybody's trying to copy it. Let's let's give the devils due. Let's give people their due. I call it the way I believe. Some people love it, some people hate it, but I'm gonna stay that way. And you know, everyone's trying to co- copy Mike Buffer, and they are. But he's the original. There's nothing like the original. You know, he's him he's, and him and his brother Bruce his Buffer brother, is just as good. It's time. You know, his brother's crazy. <laughs> he's crazy. Uh, they're, they're, he's in their shadow box in look, every fight before he makes the announcement. He's shadow box and pulling on the yeah, fence. They're the right getting listen. his hips loose. <laughs> they're the original. It's <laughs> funny. They're Hershey's they're Hershey's chocolate. Everybody else is a you know, Johnny come lately. They they're the Well, they're, I love David Diamante. He's got a nice original flair with the dreadlocks. Listen, too, there's but only one it's original when one guy's there's dominating. Only, there's only one original. And that's <laughs> listen, Buffer's the pioneer. He's the trailblazer. Yes. But Agreed. give credit to guys like Del Monte, yes. Uh they're they're trying to find their own thing. He's got a great voice. He's got his own look. He's doing a good job. But the trailblazer was Buffer. He loves you, by the way. Hey, I no, talked he, to him at the fights listen, recently. He's, he's like, oh, I love the show no, with you and Teddy. Teddy's no, my he's, man. Listen, he's terrific. He's he's taking advantage of a trail that's been blazed, and he's blazing his own trail. Uh, but he's yeah. on that trail, and and he got on that trail, and he had to he had to he had to be good um, to stay Definitely. on it. And and he's good. That's the problem when you have a trailblazer. If you come out there with a half-assed approach, you look insane. You have to bring the heat to even be in the same but stratosphere the, with someone like the Buffer Brothers. That felt yeah. That felt like contrived, like that was preordained, like that was, I don't think they knew they would have to do it, but once they got there and the fight was that competitive, that felt, again, that felt Hollywood. And like, really, like they played, they played us with that, with that part. But here's the reality, just like a Canelo fight, no different. Canelo ain't leaving that arena. He's the cash cow. He's the sacred cow. He's the guy that makes the money. He ain't leaving that arena unless you freaking knock him down 421 times and then, you know, and and, and then maybe you, you hold him down. You know, <laughs> unless you do that, 
Canelo's getting his hand raised for the most part. I mean, Bevo had to win 11 out of 12 rounds to get a close decision. That's the reality. That's the reality. And if the world wasn't watching, he wouldn't even got that. But it's follow the money. Like most businesses, unfortunately. And so, no different. No different. There's no way with everything we just talked about that was invested and has been invested in a in a in fury and in music. There's no way that Ganyu, unless he knocked him out, there's and there was a lot of hearts in the throats of a lot of important people at ringside. Believe me, believe me, believe me. They, <laughs> they were like, "Oh it's my!" So funny. Like, it's oh so my funny God. to think about how much he disrupted the apple cart. Yeah, 100%. I feel bad for Ken. Usyk. But he's got to be licking his chops thinking, yeah. you come in with well, that game plan against me, you're going to get knocked out. Well, he's not going to be the same. He's going to be back. No. But he has to, look, I'm going to cover every area, every element that people out there are thinking about. Every element. But that felt, that did felt set up. And there's no doubt I'm saying it again, that they he, he wasn't getting a decision there. But they didn't have to rob him. Because he legitimately won it. See, that's the thing. That w- When it was close like that, and they gave you that drama, and the pause, and the first score going out to Nganyo, everyone said, see, I'm right. He did win. He won. He won. And and they, they just don't want to give it to him. No. Legitimately, he, he won. He won in his effort. He won in his performance. But he didn't do enough to win on the scorecards. He he did more damage. He he did he he put more hurt, if you want to say it that way, on him than he put on him, on on Fury that he put on Ganyu, but he didn't win more rounds. He wasn't as busy. And I'll tell you, you talked about it. You mentioned patience. He part of the winning formula was patience. He was contained. He stayed within himself. He didn't get outside himself. But the reason that he looked good, and the reason why he almost pulled off enough, the reason why he's got people thinking he won is the same reason why he didn't win. You want to hear why, Ken? Think of what I just said now, Ken. That's right. Think about what I just said. The reason why he was in this fight, the reason why he shocked so many people is the same exact reason that he didn't win the fight. Because he was patient, because he didn't make mistakes, because he stayed contained, because he he didn't overdo it. Less was more. And so by not overdoing it, there was less chance of the less experienced, which was him, guy making mistakes and allowing the more experienced guy, Fury, to take advantage of those mistakes. <laughs> so he had a game plan. They had a game plan. They stayed patient. They stayed buttoned up. They stayed contained. They played it close to the vest. That kept that allowed him to be in the mix. That allowed him to have a terrific performance. Because if he did too much, he would have made possibly mistakes that would have opened the doors of opportunity for fury. But he, but he didn't. He did just enough. And at the end of the day, and this isn't going to sound good to some people, he did just enough to lose a very good-looking, competitive-looking fight. If if he would have... he To win the fight, if he would have done the things that he had to do to win the fight, there would have been a chance that Fury would have had the floodgates opened to take advantage of his lack of experience. Again, what allowed him to have this unbelievable performance was the same thing that conspired against him to win. Being controlled, doing just enough, not taking too many chances, just being controlled. If he, to win though, not to have a good performance, not to get him close to the finish line, but to get over the finish line, and I'm telling you the truth, and I'm not knocking him. 
He won. His life is better than ever now. But to really win on the scorecards that we're talking about, he would have had to do a little more, which would have possibly been to his disadvantage. Or he would have won. He would have legitimately won on his scorecards. But he wasn't experienced enough to feel that and to know that. So they played it safe. They played it the right way. And it got him here. And it was the right thing to play it that way for them. But in order to win on this, on this, on this, on this, to win on that, on the scorecard, he would have had to take more risk. He would have, he would have had to, to be busier, to press more behind the jab. And he might have done it, but they weren't sure. They weren't sure. Because it could have easily went the other way. And it could have spit right back in their face. You know that old Dylan song, be careful you don't spit in the wind, it'll come back and hit you. <laughs> and the that, one? and guarantee you, Ken, if he would have doubled up the jab more, if he would have pressed more with the jab, you know, he did some good body work too. I mean, he really was impressive for where, a uh, you know, for the lack of experience. That's what I was going to ask you is just how surprised were you? I mean, we knew he had skills and we knew he had athleticism, but I But was I laid it all out. I how, said it. They yeah. did a good job. Dewey did a good job. He's coachable. It's not just the physical part. It's also the cerebral part. He, Fred, that's why I gave him a chance again. He was cerebral enough, smart enough, to learn things, to know how to put them to use. And he was. I felt he was, at least. And it turned out he was. But there's another X factor here. They're human beings. Yeah, Tyson Fury's heavyweight champ. Yeah, he's the second greatest promoter of, of all time behind Ali. <laughs> uh, all of that. And he's got a great heart and a great story. But he's human. Now, I'm taking nothing away from Ngannou, but I want to cover all bases. And nobody else would touch on this. But part of the reason, part of the X factor, and part of why I gave going in, it's all out there. Look at the stuff before the fight that I said that he could win. It's a dangerous ESPN ran it. I, you know, I did it with Vin Thomas, the great coach, the great MMA coach. We did a Dean thing on Thomas. Dean Thomas. We did it why he could win. It, it's on a lot of platforms out there before the fight. Oh, yeah. You were very vocal about your uh, interest, about your thoughts on Francis. I, I, like I said at the beginning of the show, one of the few people on the planet that was actually giving Francis a chance. And not to not to knock Chell Sonnen too much. I love Chell, but the day before right. the fight, he was literally saying like, oh, this is like the Lakers against the yeah, Globetrotters. They're going to destroy. But he's got the guts, the guts, yeah, got the guts to go out there and say it. Not everyone and does. And he came back, though. He came back yesterday. Yesterday and posted and he's always like giving shit to um francis but he came back and was like i was wrong francis yeah. is like this and you gotta is appreciate what he did that. was incredible and you oh, gotta appreciate that Jill. he's got the guts to say what he believes and then yeah and then man enough to make to just come back and say i was wrong and that's all you can ask of a person one of the things i pointed to to give fury i mean and gone you a chance ken was that and it had to be all part of the mix. A lot of it had to be a perfect storm of things to happen. It did. And they all happened. And one of those perfect storm of a mix of an element had to be that Fury had to mentally, 75% mental, not take him serious. Now, physically, he did. He was in good shape, good enough shape. But mentally, he didn't. He didn't. I'm going to put my bottom dollar. And he will make an excuse. I give him credit for that. And I'm not making an excuse. And Ganyu deserves every bit of credit. Every bit of credit I've given him here. Every bit of it. But there's no doubt in my world, in my mind, that Tyson Fury was compromised in a way that as a human being, he too thought it was going to be a, a, a fun thing, a money grab. <laughs> it was it was gonna be I agree. it was gonna be where he does what he wants. He wants to end it, he ends it, he wants to play, he wants to do an alley shuffle, he wants to, you know, whatever he wants to do, he could do it. 
and and there was going to be no there was going to be nothing to worry about and that you can't go into any contest at this level if you're Tom Brady going out on a football field you can't say it's going to be an easy day because you're going to get screwed nope. You can't, That's right. if you're Michael Jordan going on a basketball court, you can't say, oh, it's going to be like playing a high school team. You're screwed. You can't be. Well, Fury you, said it before the fight. He said, you're going to have a table tennis guy trying to play yeah. Djokovic in well, the finals, and I'm going to kill you. And- look, he knows how to talk. He knows how to promote. He knows how to say the yeah. the. The, the 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 voice drops the what do they call it, the uh you know voiceovers not voice <laughs> sound over, bites uh, sound bites he sound knows bites. how to give you the great sound bites but the problem is he really did think that and yeah I know you have to be as ready mentally as you are physically when you go into that arena or whatever that arena is you can't go into a courtroom as a lawyer and say I'll be out of here in two minutes that this is a joke no. You, you then then you become the joke. You have to be mentally ready. Like this is the toughest day you're gonna have. This is the toughest opponent you're gonna have. Even if it turns out not to be, you have to be mentally one hundred percent geared for that. And if you're not, you can't recalibrate once the horse leaves the barn. You can't. You can't all of a sudden, you can see Tyson Fury's face when he got dropped to the dirt. Like, holy crap. This is not what I thought it was. And and But it's hard to get the toothpaste back in the tube, to get the genie back in the bottle. Once you go in there mentally where you have not, prepared yourself or believe in yourself that it's going to be what it usually is a uh, 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 a fight that you got to be all eight cylinders got to be clicking that you got to be on high alert you got to be on that calm five at all times once you relax from that once you allow yourself to believe nah this is a sunday stroll in the park this is this is not a full day. I'll be calling her early, honey. I'm coming home early today. That's uh, that's you know, take out a bottle of wine, cook up a couple of steaks on the grill. I'm coming home. I'm I'm not putting in a full day. Once you start thinking that it's gonna be automatically show up, and it's just gonna happen because you're experienced, because you got a sub- inferior guy in front of you, you're not gonna have to be what you normally have to be. that I believe that was at play. I believe at the end of the day, that was one of the most important X factors that he did not really... And I said, I said, if I'm going to yeah, be no, right... like that. I said, if I'm right about this being a tough or competitive fight and, and then Ganyu surprising people, if I'm right, that has to be part of the equation that Fury doesn't mentally take him... And he didn't. No matter what he says, because I give him credit, he's not making no excuses. But he didn't. And then my son brought up a brilliant point. He said, Dad, you know, and Ganyu obviously had all the film in the world to watch of Fury. All of it. Fury had nothing to watch of Ganyu. Nothing That's to right. expect. The only thing that he could have was what he visualized in his head. That he That's put right. in his head that probably this guy's going to be just, you know, a guy allow me to kind of like a move him around like a marionette. A novice. Like a marionette. Him to look like a marionette novice, with like, strings. Yeah. Like I'm going to move him around like a puppet. He's uh, the only thing he had. He had no film. He had the film in his head that he created. That he put a visual because you always put some visual that you uh, that you imagine what you're gonna have in front of you, and I could only imagine what his visual was. That it was just a guy that he he would control on the outside. He go in, he go out, he go to the side, he fake this way, go that way. He you know he would do whatever he wanted. That's the only vi- and it wasn't a real visual. It wasn't a real visual. So he had nothing to be prepared to help him have a little fear. Yeah, I use that word. To have a little anxiety. Yeah, I use that word. A little trepidation, a, something to keep them a little on edge because when we're going into something that's extreme, we have to have that little edge. And I don't think that edge was there because he didn't know. He didn't know. He thought he knew what he was going in there, <laughs> that he was going in there with an easy day work. But the reality was he wasn't prepared for what 
was really going to come. I know that you came prepared because I know we sent you some AG1 travel packs. Athletic Greens, go to athleticgreens.com slash Atlas, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. I know on those cross uh, transcontinental flights, you were loading up and probably doubling up on the AG1 on departure and arrival. And I know you took them as soon as you got home to prepare for the um, recording today because... Part of having a strong mental game is maintaining your health, especially your um, overall wellness and immunity system when traveling, uh, especially on a long flight like that. Athletic Greens is made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients you'll need coming off those long flights. So I'm sure that's what kept you on point while you were over there, you and Teddy Jr. So Thanks to the people at Athletic Greens for making such a great product. It's honestly our favorite. They've been with us since the jump, and Teddy and I take this stuff every day. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas to take advantage of the 10 free travel packs. Listen, I couldn't travel halfway across the world, which I just did, and get on this show, come home, put my bags down, shave, shower, and... uh. Watch the fight real quick to make sure that I saw it, like I said, in a cold environment where I wasn't influenced by anything but what I saw. I couldn't do that without some help. And part of that help is, as you just said, not only putting the right things in your body that make you feel good, but that you... What did I just finish talking about? 75% of this business is mental. You can't... It's not just putting something in your body that's the right stuff, but you got to believe it's the right stuff. You got to believe it helps you. You got to believe that it's going to give you a little edge, a little bit of that that advantage, if you will, that you need when you're compromised a little bit, traveling and all the things that you just touched on. You have to believe, just like you could have all the talent in the world, like I talked about in Ganyu, but you have to believe that you could get that talent and execute that talent in a ring, that, that you can, that when that moment comes, you can answer the bell, if you will. Well, it's the same thing with any product you're taking. You have to believe when the bell rings, that product is the right product. Not only that it feels right when you take it and, you know, it's, it's good ingredients, but you have to believe that, hey, this is giving me, and I come to believe that. And that's why, you know, when you do make a trip like this and you have to grab some stuff quick, you you want to grab the stuff that you believe in. It's easy It's easy to dismiss this stuff and think, oh, these guys are just shilling for that product. No, we, we approach them. We ask them to come on because, like, I take, I, I take this every single day. You are what you eat. And if you don't believe that, it's like thinking that you're just lifting weights for aesthetics to look good. If you don't believe you're building functional strength to help you overall in your life with your mental health as well as physical, you're missing the point. And it's the same thing with diet. It's just about, it's as much about your mental health as it is physical. If you don't have a balanced, healthy diet and you're not getting all the nutrients and minerals that you need every day well you're making a mistake and you're playing at a huge disadvantage and that's the truth so athletic greens is uh is like a secu- it's like a insurance policy for me a lot of people were saying and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna ever attack someone when they're down and fury's not down but a lot, his reputation maybe his legacy was 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 smacked a little bit. I, I Again, I'm here trying to put out what should be put out, what other people don't put out sometimes that's going to give explanations for things, answer questions that I believe are important and that fans want to know, quite frankly. And I'm not going to jump and say, oh my God, he's terrible, he's that. He didn't look great. No doubt about it. You don't need Teddy Atlas. Matter of fact, there were spots he looked bad. Like when he turned south, boy, he was falling in with the left hand, reaching to get in, stumbling to get in. He's lucky, maybe in those parts where Nganyu wasn't more advanced, where he could have counted him with an uppercut or something. Maybe. But there were spots there where he fumbled. Like I said, reaching him from the left-hand stance, (laughs) uh, falling in, 
even flicking his jab. His elbow was flying out. He was flicking it where he was losing force behind it from the shoulder. He was given a little telegraph with the elbow coming out. You know, and again, I'm not saying that he dominated with a Larry Holmes jab or Muhammad Ali jab or Sonny Liston jab or George Foreman jab when he won some of those dead rounds. But I'm just saying he won those rounds by just doing more than the other guy was doing. Enough to win steel, if you will, those rounds. There was a lot of places you could criticize him. And he's being criticized. And I'm not here to protect him. I'm not here to, as, again, to, to jump on a, on, a, on a body that's been on the floor for a minute. I, I'm, I'm never going to do that, kick a guy when he's down. But I am going to do my job. I thought from the beginning, and I know it's easy to say now, but from the beginning, the people out there that were a little drinking the Kool-Aid, they were a little drunk with whatever they were drunk with, and we all get drunk with that stuff, what we want to feel, what we want to believe, we think we're right. But when they were saying that Fury was the greatest heavyweight of all time, I was like, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> just just <laughs> slow, yeah, that, slow, slow yeah. down. And, and again, I'm not going to say that he's a, he's a fraud. He's not. He, he's a versatile heavyweight who's 270 pounds, who's six foot nine, who can box, he can fight inside, he's got a chin. Uh, not, well, not a great inside fighter, but uh, he can press you with his size. Um, he, he beat uh, water on the inside, though. He did in the last fight, uh, even, even a little bit in the second fight, but especially in the last fight, and he got dropped too, got off the floor again. Uh, he's got great heart. He, again, he's he's very dimensional. He's a great promoter. Um, he's still all of that. He's still. But I never thought that he should be enshrined as the greatest heavyweight of all time. When you just like I didn't think Canelo should be enshrined as the greatest Mexican fighter. It's not right. It's not fair to the fighters that are out there that are part of history that have resumes that are greater. That are greater. Listen, Fury still has time to make his resume greater and, and to make up for what happened the other night. <laughs> and he's done great things. And that shouldn't be forgotten. He had an off night. And Ganya was part of that off night. But he had an off night. But to say he was the greatest of all time, that, that was getting ahead of yourself. And again, not because now he, he was exposed. You know, some people will say he was exposed. I think he had an off night. I think mentally he was not geared right. But I still think Nganyu gets the credit because he was geared right. He was prepared. He did a tremendous job. And sometimes the greatest ally you can have is just the unexpected. Just the unexpected. Where, you know, the where you're doing something that nobody thought. Just the... the unexpectedness of something sometimes can be the most important thing. And I think that played that, that he wasn't expecting this. But when you looked at his resume, you know, his big win against Klitschko, Klitschko was 39. He, he outboxed him. He moved. He, he made Klitschko look like a robot. Great win. Great win. And then, you know, three, one draw, and two wins against Wilder. Great puncher, but not a great fighter. Not a great technician, but a great puncher. And he got off the floor a couple times to win a fight. And then recently, Chisora, who is a warrior of warriors, but at the end of his career, uh, Dayan White, uh, you know, who really was very, quite frankly, was disappointing in that fight. Very disappointing. But... A big, strong guy that could have been dangerous. Nobody thought that. Nobody thought. And again, it's he's not Joe Frazier, Dean White. We get it, but nobody expected. You look back now; it's easy to throw darts to say, "Oh, he beat Dean White. He beat Shizora." Well, Dean White is a big, strong guy that nobody expected him to get taken apart. And and I will say, Dean White. Looked like he wasn't prepared for whatever reason. But all you can go by is what was done. And Fury took him apart. 
finished him with an uppercut, took him apart. And again, it's not the resume that Ali has. It's not Foreman. It's not Frey. You can only have the resume of the people around during your era, during your time. But I never thought that he should have been in that, announced in that air of those guys, the Joe Lewis, the Allies, you know, even the Larry Holmes, you know, uh, the Jack Johnsons. I mean, again, just like I'm not, I'm, I'm not knocking Canelo, but they don't know what they don't know. Some of these fans that say, oh, the greatest, they don't know who was around that they're not, they're not looking at, they're not giving credit to, that they're not aware of. And it's the same thing with that. The heavyweight division has so many magnificent to say anybody. I don't care even if Usyk beats him. You can't say he's the greatest heavyweight. of the. It's still a work in progress. He still has a chance to add to that resume. But it, it, it's part of being a fan. And people get crazy with that stuff. So now everyone's going to go and attack him. Look to slit his throat now. You know, and say, ah, he was exposed. He's a fraud. Uh, what a joke it was. Yeah, it was, it was hasty to call him the greatest of all time. Let's say that. But he's not a joke. Again, I'm not here to apologize for him. But he's still a versatile 270-pound guy that can box that can also press forward, that, you know, uh, has has the kind of uh, dimensions to him that you used to see in smaller guys, and you can't pick too many big guys you've seen that with. So he had a bad night. He's going to get a chance to redeem himself. And Ganyu had a great night. Uh, and Ganyu, you know, go watch the Rocky movie. Uh and, and you feel like you watched that fight because the greatest thing Ganyu did was he reminded us all that if you have a dream, follow it. Work your backside off and follow the dream. And if people tell you you can't do it, say, yeah, watch and, and follow your dream. And if roadblocks get put up where, you know, something goes a little array here and there and it doesn't go perfect and... Well, Keep going. Go around the roadblock. Keep going. Believe in your destiny. Believe in your dream. And Ganyu did. And you know what? He, 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 was, he was rocky. He didn't get the decision, just like Rocky didn't get it the first time. But there's always a sequel. There's always a Rocky too. And I think people now are stay tuned or staying tuned to see the sequel to this. To see Nganyu, you know, Rocky too. They really are. And he put himself in that position, and his people did. So I hope I gave, I, I hope I laid it out for everybody. I think that when you're seeing, I, I, again, it's a natural phenomena. When you're seeing something you don't expect to see, I think that it's human nature to take it to the next point. And when you're seeing something like this and you're seeing an upset, you're saying, oh, he won. Before you really look at it in real deep detail. And like I said, at ringside, yeah. If, if you would have told me and gone your one, I'm not going to really give a huge value. I would have said it's close. Let me look at it when, when I get home. You know, but it was close. I could see it being a draw. Okay, you want to give it to him? But... You just, you know, you don't know until you get out of that atmosphere sometimes. And this was one of those sometimes. To get out of that atmosphere, get into a, more of a vacuum, you know, get into a, you know, a, a, an in isolated place, uh, a sterile place, as I said earlier, and just see what was really happening rather than what you started to believe was happening because you got carried with that emotion. And, and it was emotion. It was real. And, and then Ganyu made it real. He made it real with the knockdown. He made it real with not, you know, not looking sloppy, not making it easy for Tyson Fury. At the end of the day, it was, uh, I think it's a good thing for boxing because it, 
it brought a lot of eyeballs to the sport. A lot of people were saying, Teddy, it's going to hurt the sport because you had a MMA guy with one pro fight almost beat the heavyweight champ. I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think that it brings more interest, more interest in the sport. And you know what? The sport needs that. 100%. I don't think that there was any downside whatsoever. People think that it was a knock on boxing. I disagree. Two guys had a fight. One guy who came a little bit unprepared and one guy like shocked the world with how proficient he was. At the end of the day, if more people tune in, that's ultimately what we're looking for. I got a nice, had a nice exchange with, um, with Francis's uh, MMA coach, Eric Nixick. He sends his regards to you. He was obviously like, you know, probably took a back seat in the preparation to the boxing coaching. But um, Eric is a super nice guy, obviously a force in the MMA community. And he sends his uh, best regards to you. Yeah, listen, he's sitting in a catbird seat right now. He believed in what he was doing. And it turned out, you know, they, they made a, took a little bit of a risk leaving the UFC and um, going over to this and... I think they had their eyes on it from a long time ago, but they they executed it. They had a vision. He was part of that vision, and it's nice to see people execute their dreams or, or fulfill their dreams and actually um, stick with it and get it done. But either way, it's an upset. No matter whose hand got raised, it was an upset. Just that Nganyu performed the way he did. And it, no matter what, he won, and his people won. They, they won. They're in a much better position than they were before. Uh, if it was stock, the stock just split, uh, if, if you wanted to use those kind of analogies. I mean, it went through the roof. There was a public offering. Whatever way you want to describe it, uh, it, it their stock, you know, it's like AT&T uh, at this point. And even everyone that they had there, I, I, again, I want to, I, I respect fighters. And I want to, do they all behave the way that I wish that fighters would behave outside the ring as well as inside? Not all, but nobody does that in anything. Nobody in your business uh, can. Nobody in my daughter's business of being a lawyer. Nobody in Pedro's business of law. No, You know, you just hope that they can behave in both theaters. In the theater of work, whatever that may be, in their theater of life. And I'm going to tell you why I'm taking the time to announce these names. They perform in the theater of life. They couldn't be more of a champion. Every one of them was a champion in the ring. Every one of them has behaved and acted as a champion outside the ring, um, as gentlemen. And I, uh, starting from Adesanya, I mean, this is you talk about a who's who's list. Adesanya, Larry Holmes, and his wife, uh, his <laughs> devoted great wife, Buster Douglas, you know, and his devoted wife, Holyfield, uh, Conor McGregor, Miguel Cotto. I mean, I'm going to say every one of them that that I was with for all those days. We were together in all these, whether it was lunch, whether it was having dinner, whether it was at the fight, whether it was at the pre-fights, uh, all of them. Uh, Lennox Lewis, Michael Spinks. Uh, I flew back with Michael Spinks and Larry Holmes and my son and their, uh, their wives. Uh, Randy Couture, one of the pioneers of the UFC. Uh, Roberto Duran, Hans of Stones, must I say even more anymore, and his sons. His sons were there too. Sugar Ray Leonard, everyone knows he's one of my favorite fighters of all time, could fit into any era, <laughs> any era. Uh, Chuck Liddell, another pioneer, cinder blocks. They had the cinder blocks of the UFC, guys that, that really <laughs> were there when the foundation of that great, great organization uh, and brand was was first being formed. Uh, Amir Khan, Prince Hamed, um, uh, and his sons, Frank Bruno, he could he could actually teach classes to some fighters on how to conduct yourself after your career outside the ring as as just a pure sportsman and gentleman. Rampage Jackson, another center block of the UFC. Uh, Shannon Briggs, my former fighter uh, in in his first five years, and and it was I got to tell you, it was emotional. I had some emotional moments there. Where I haven't seen some of these guys or talked to them, and that's 
just to feel the uh just to feel the love genuine uh you know I hope it stays that way <laughs> you never but but at that moment to feel that love and for him to see that he expressed to see me and my son uh, it was it was one of those moments. What can I say? Antonio Tava, another guy could be an ambassador for the sport, as Shannon Briggs could be. I mean they they know they know how to talk. They know, they know they they have great personalities. Another one, Roy Jones Jr. You know, better BF, Bevo, the current champions in a light heavyweight uh, right now. Chisora, uh I, I saw. Matter of fact, what a gentleman he is. You know, I know that he he's heard me say some things about he should retire, but he also knows that he's one of my favorite fighters. He's a warrior, nothing but a pure. He should have that tattooed on his head. I mean, he, he he's a pure warrior, and I do get concerned that at this point in his career, at thirty eight, thirty nine, that he's still doing it. Yeah, and I say what I feel. I'm not a, I'm not afraid to, and that some people appreciate that, some people don't. But it is what it is. But what a gentleman, what a gentleman, and what appreciation I have for him, came over to me uh, to say hello. Joe Kalsaki, retired undefeated, he's there with his, with his sons. What a tremendous, we talk about Usyk being the winner that he is, and he is, We've, we shouldn't forget Kalsaki. You know, I always use the phrase that, that Usyk knows how to do one thing special better than most. And maybe better than anyone right now. He knows how to win. Or oh, Tyson Fury's up there too. But he knows how to win. And Joe Kazaki knew how to win. Antonio Pereira, what a gentleman he is with his family. He comes up to me and says out of nowhere. He comes up to me at the weigh-in. And he says, Teddy, I agree with you about Canelo. I agree that he's not the greatest. And that people don't want to hear it, but... I say it on my podcast, on, uh, on, on my show, and I, I just want to thank you. I said, for what? For saying it. And I said, well, I said, um, you know, you're probably doing better with popularity over there in Mexico than I am because it hasn't got me a lot of um, roses for saying it. He left. He said, but it's the truth. It's the truth. We know he's a good fighter, and he is. He's a terrific, but he's not the greatest man. It, and, and he even... When he said it to me, I said, I only say it because I think it's an insult to some of the other great Mexican fighters. You've had a tradition of great, 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 great Mexican warriors, champions. And to say he's the greatest without having the real understanding and knowledge and information of how many greats, I, I think it's a disservice to the other greats, yourself included. And he said, that's why I'm thanking you. Because I agree with you, I say it, and on my show, and I agree. And and again, no knock on Canelo. I think he's terrific. I think he's terrific. But I'm. I also think that there's been a lot of other Mexican fighters that people just aren't appreciating right now because they're not around right now. And I I try to do my job to bring a light to that. So it was just really fresh air. Um, even my son said he said, "Wow, that was just so." special. It was one thing after another with these special people. Eric Morales, another special Mexican warrior and champion, and his son, uh, Uzik, of course, who's just, you know, again, a champion. I'm only announcing, I'm only giving their names because every one of them, for me, was is a, a winner outside the ring, the way they behave, not just inside. Uh, every one of them, just... Just nothing before, and I talking about the moments he wasn't there at these. He was there working with ESPN, but it was another one of those moments. I was thinking, should I say it? You know what? Yeah, I might be dead tomorrow. Really, we don't know what life has in store for us. I I just know I had a good trip with my son, and I'm blessed, and I could share it with him. But Tim Bradley, who I haven't talked to, um, he came over to me at the weigh-in. And that was emotional. And um, it was important because it reminded me that I love him and his family. So it was just, it was just so many different things that, that weren't expected. I wasn't prepared for. Um, and uh, it was just one after another. And, and like I said, at the end of the day, the best 
the best thing was my the best attendee there, number one attendee with all these names that I just mentioned. Number one, Teddy Atlas the third. That he for me, that he was there and every fighter came over. Oh, you're Teddy's son. And just to make him feel that way, I can't tell you how emotional it makes me. And um to have him there with me every step of the way it was it truly is priceless and um and he earned his keep he was my pr man <laughs> par excellence he was snapping the pictures putting up the post uh where we were doing our social media we got as of yesterday we had over five million i think it's five and a half million uh impressions they call it i'm learning about the game uh impressions whatever the hell that is but but hits whatever geeks gooks cocks whatever uh we had over five million five and a half million who knows what it is now it was it was really something and he did the job over there my daughter did the job handling things over here uh can't be more appreciative of of having a family like i do and how you know how you just get reminded of of how lucky you are and you know what ken one other thing I know patting ourselves on the back a little bit, but I don't know. Sometimes, you know, you get an itch. You, maybe you're just scratching yourself. Maybe you're not really patting yourself. But if our fans that listened to our f show last week when we were previewing this fight, and you, you as you always do, you did a great job in bringing up the, the lines and the betting prospects for that with my bookie, and you asked me which way I would go. Again, go to the videotape. But I think we made some money again for some of our people out there with my bookie because I said go with the over. And the over was giving you a nice line. You know, um, I didn't know how many people wanted to lay 1,400 or 1,200, whatever it was, for Fury. I thought Fury would win, but I didn't say go that way. I said, no, 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 I'm not laying that kind of lumber. No. Uh, because the guy can punch, because miracles do happen, uh, crazy things do happen, and one almost did happen. If he, if that, if Tyson Fury don't have the heart he has, uh, there's a new heavyweight champ. But I did say the way I would go betting that, if you wanted to bet it, was with the over, because you were getting a really, because it showed you where everybody was thinking. You had to lay yeah. a lot of money to bet the under. And they were giving you a really nice comeback to go with the over. And I, I said, go with the over. Yeah, you did. You were right on the screws. And by the way, for anyone listening, if you want more thorough uh, breakdowns of the fight action every week, Teddy also does a great job with uh, Paulie Malinaji and Chris Algieri on the Pro Box podcast. You can check it out at Pro Box Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. But, Teddy, that was a super thorough breakdown. I'm sure things will come up throughout the uh, course of the next few days and weeks that will uh, remind you of things that happened over there. And I'm sure we'll be, uh, look, everyone will be looking forward to hearing more about the, uh, the trip to Saudi. But that's an excellent, thorough breakdown. And to be honest with you, one thing that I'd like to touch on next week when we have a chance is Oshaki Foster had a fight. Um, against Hernandez this weekend. Oh my God! What an unbelievable! Can fight you send Foster it to me? Losing. I've been doing yeah. a lot of stuff. The eleventh round was yeah. an incredible round, incredible. and you know, incredible. I can't say this too often, but thank you for sending that to me. You know why? Because that eleventh round, I believe, you know, I, I was pretty tired and I was watching it uh, as I was going from one airport to another in Saudi Arabia and getting ready to board another flight. I had a, a little time uh, with the layover, and I watched it, and I was like, now I know why Ken sent it to me. Hernandez, I think it was Hernandez that got hurt in the 11th. Um, Eduardo uh, Hernandez, yeah, yeah. not only did he, he get hurt, well, or well, he, was, he was winning. Yeah, yeah he but he gets, hurt, he gets hurt bad in the 11th round, right? I have it right, right? I want yeah, to, because yeah, I'm yeah, tired. Yeah. And he gets hurt, and it looks like he might get stopped, to be honest with you. And there's not many fights that bring me back to two of the greatest fights I ever saw in my life. There are not many that I can make the parallels with, and especially one round. And when I saw that round, I immediately went to 
Castillo Corrales, their first fight, the one round, uh, it was an incredible round, fight. <laughs> but there was a round that was just unreal where, where it looks like Corrales is going to get knocked out and then he comes back and, and, and turns the tables on Castillo. And then there's one other, Mickey Ward and Arturo Gatti. The first fight, the, the sequels are usually not as good, but the first fight, and there was a round there too. I forget, it was the eighth round, the ninth, whatever round it was, uh, late in the fight where Gatti, Gatti was hurt bad. Well, there was a couple yeah, rounds where, round. yeah, really hurt bad. Like he's gone. It's gonna, they're going to stop it. Matter of fact, they did the late, great, great Emmanuel Stewart, God bless him up, up there, um, said, this is over. He actually said, I think, this is over. And, and, then, mm -hmm. and then something from inside where the special ones have it. Something from inside that they don't even know they have it until they find out that they have to find out they have it. And then all of a sudden, Gaddy comes back. Uh, that's what this round, that's what that 11th round looked like. It looked like the Ward Gaddy rounds that we're talking about. It looked like the Castillo Corrales rounds. It, it was, and I'll give you one more since we're talking about heavyweights before. You know, another one of the greatest last, one of the greatest rounds of all time in heavyweight boxing was, Ken? What's that? It was one of the last, it might have been the last 15-round heavyweight title fight, 15-round fight. It might have been the last one. It was Ken Norton against Larry Holmes. And what a 15th round. And, and what implications. It changed both men's lives. If Holmes don't win that round, he's not Larry Holmes. And Larry Holmes becomes, uh, Eddie no Ed Norton becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, Ken Norton, I'm sorry. Ken Norton, I'm thinking of the Honeymooners. Ken Norton becomes Larry Holmes, takes Larry Holmes' spot and has his life. But Larry Holmes did just enough. He found a way. It was an unbelievable 15th round. That's, that's what this Hernandez, uh, what do you call it, fight, reminded me of. Foster. That, and and yeah. just, just so people have context, because I want us to go, I want you to watch it and let's talk about it next week. I think it's a relatively quiet week. Is Osharki Foster comes in at 20, 21 and 2. He's the WBC super featherweight champion. And he's fighting challenger Eduardo Rocky Hernandez, who's 34 and 2 with 31 knockouts, which at that weight is a lot. And uh, listen to the scorecards going into the 12th round or going in. Uh, was ahead on. He was ahead on the scorecards. I, uh, Hernandez was ahead 80 to 72 and 79 73 at the time of the stoppage in the 12th round with like a half a minute to go. So Foster was getting outboxed, outworked at 130 pounds. And comes back, you had that 11th round where they, bo I mean, both of them were going back and forth. Foster may have got the best of it, but Hernandez wasn't going away. And then Foster closed the show. The ref stopped in to save Hernandez. But, oh, my God, what a great fight. I mean, this one could have easily slipped under the radar for, like, you know, anyone but boxing purists. But I know this is one we would have done a thorough breakdown of if you weren't on a flight for the last 24 hours. So, well, we did a we did a good breakdown on that round though because hell yeah that and we'll round do the whole fight on it, next week yeah we will very rarely does one round stand up yep to those rounds I just mentioned very rarely very rarely and that did and the one other thing I say you were talking about the foundation dinner November sixteenth um. I picked up an extra guest while I was out there. Guess who's coming, Ken? I know you and Rob are going to be there, and I know you're going to be excited to hear this. Guess who's coming? Uh, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, you were with literally like a better collection. Larry Holmes. Oh, that'll be great. Larry Holmes and his great, great, his beautiful, special wife, Diane. Um, they we We were together, of course, out there, and we flew home together. So I asked him to come, and he said, I'll be there. So he's going to come to the uh, to the dinner, too. That'll be great. Well, next week, maybe we'll talk about some kind of uh, contest. Maybe we'll give away a, a ticket to sit at the table with Rob and I. Yeah, on, that'd be um, nice. At the dinner. We may have an extra one or two spots, uh, but um, love to get some of the fans involved. So tune in next week for the breakdown of the Foster-Hernandez uh, fight and also for a chance to win a ticket to the um, – 
to the Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner. It's going to be fantastic. It always is. It'd be a who's who of boxing royalty, at least in the New York area and many people flying in from all over the world. But Teddy, thanks for all this. I know you're exhausted. What thanks other name? Teddy what Jr. other for name? Handling all the production. Oh yeah, Teddy did a great job. What other name? I talked about all the special people that I saw out there that were gentlemen that really, really do make the sport look good. They do. They, they, there's people that make it look bad, but there's always the ones that make it look good. And the tra- he's a trainer now. He's a former junior middleweight champ of the world, but he's now a trainer. He does a good job. He had Joseph Parker winning on the undercard. A nice win for Joseph Parker, the heavyweight, uh, who's a good, solid heavyweight. But uh, I'm talking about Andy Lee, the former champ. Oh, I love Andy Lee, yeah. Irish Andy Lee. Yeah, he was out there too, but... Anyway, uh, he's going to come to the dinner, Andy Lee. No, he. I'm saying he was out there, uh, out there, and and. Oh, gotcha. Uh, well, if you're listening, Andy, we'll see you Thursday the 16th in Staten Island. We'd love to see you. Love to well, have you at the dinner it's with a us. A long trip for him, though. He's living in Ireland, I believe. So, but you never we'll know. Send over the um, the Dr. Atlas Foundation jet. Yeah, uh, the jet that we would have to <laughs> borrow from you. Yeah. <laughs> One of your toys. What are your toys? We don't have <laughs> wish, toys like I that. I wish. We don't have toys like I that. I wish. Well, in other news, Cameron won his flag football championship. Oh, My friend Eric Decker came down to watch him. Cameron had three touchdowns and an extra point. Super proud of him. And and I'm I'm mentioning it because he said to me, Dad, are you gonna tell Teddy that I that, that I won that I got a touchdown? I said, We'll see. We'll see if we can fit it in. Somebody so said, that was his that was his number one priority after the thing. Are you gonna tell Teddy? Because every time anyone mentions anything about boxing or jujitsu to him, he's like, Yeah, no, I have a trainer. I have a trainer. And he said, I can't well, work yeah. with anyone without talking to him first. Yeah, he's like so. he's like Tom Hagen in The Godfather. You know when uh, <laughs> when uh, when the Hollywood producer asked him he said um how come i never heard of you tom you know he's a lawyer he goes i have, I have one client <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> well teddy like i said thanks for doing this thanks to sam and especially teddy jr for being over there and helping out with everything uh, on the production side while you were away so Awesome job all around. And guys, we'll be back next week with a thorough breakdown of some of the fights we missed this weekend. And we'll talk more about the foundation dinner and how you can get involved and come and say hello to us. Thank you, Teddy.